Thank you very much, Carolyn, and thank you to all of you for being here in the launch of this very exciting and very important initiative that we're here to um, launch and celebrate and know more about. <clears throat> and uh, it's a great honor for me and even more a pleasure to be here with you and to be associated with this program because I think it's, it really captures so many of the very important salience point that we are addressing uh, now in the world as it is. But let me um, first of all say that um, I want to pay tribute to the full team that has developed this and of course in particular to SLU, to Professor Ulf Magnusson and to Dr. Carolyn Glynn for also organizing this event today. I'm also very happy to see that this has been such a strong cooperation between SLU, the University of Lund, the University of Gothenburg, and the Stockholm Environment Institute. I think this illustrates how much Swedish universities and institutes can contribute with a science-based knowledge to development, to the development agenda, and to the development agenda we now call Agenda 2030. I'm also very happy to see the strong support and the strong financial support from CEDA in this. It's, it's path-breaking and something uh, during my time until recently as a member of the CEDA board, we discussed a lot how can CEDA, with its mandate, catalyze uh, competence, knowledge, expertise in Swedish institutions uh, in a more effective way than maybe in the past. Anyway, that's for you to judge, but I'm very happy of the CEDA involvement. It's, it's a pleasure to stand here and with the long history that Carolyn enumerated, I remember actually already in the 70s the important role that SAU professors, scientists, experts played. And I would like to highlight two things. In the early 70s, the CGIAR, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, was set up to meet the needs of famines, widespread hunger, poverty, destitution around the world. Those of you who are old enough, which are not many here, but those of you who remember that time as, as a, a challenging time with the World Food Summit and a lot of funding and commitment going into doing something about it. SLU already at that time had a very strong involvement. A few years later, in 1975, SOREC was established as a way of, within the Swedish aid program, really support building of scientific capacity and supporting uh, <clears throat> collaboration on development issues within the research community. And SLU was one of the key institutions in backstopping that and supporting it. And just to mention Evert Åberg and um, Nils Nyqvist, who recently passed away as two giants among many that were really very much passionate of, of developing this program. Also in CEDA's large bilateral program uh, developed in the 70s, there was also quite a lot of involvement by SLU. And the current vice chancellor, Peter Högberg, can testify to this, having been a field worker in Tanzania in the 80s. So I stress this to underline the very great and long tradition that this program is part of. As a member of the SLU board, it is really a pleasure to see how this international perspective has taken root and also been institutionalized here in SLU. We have the SLU Global, and we also have the Global Child News University Alliance, and throughout the full SLU quite a lot of commitment. And one testimony to this is that 20% of SLU scientific publications, they stem from programs or projects conducted in collaboration with low-income countries. So for the board, it's very clear that SLU, to be relevant for Sweden, has to be involved in the wider world. And not only through students and through visiting scientists, but through institutionalized collaborations with centers of excellence and with other institutions around the globe. And as my history shows, it's really inconceivable today to 
think of SLU as purely having a national Swedish agenda. We are, as you all know, part of a profoundly integrating new world. We are integrating, we are dependent upon it, and we're committed to it. It's a world that we haven't chosen. It's a world that we're faced with, with all its greatness and all its challenges. It's beautiful and it's grim at the same time. And it's closer to us than ever. Just think of our neighbors in geography, it's Denmark, Finland, Norway. But if you think about what migration, remittances, travel, family connections, and virtual contacts mean, that's to say the intensity and the volume of contacts, you have to add to our geographical neighbors, our virtual neighbors, Eritrea, Syria, Somalia, Afghanistan. And this is for the long haul. So, obviously, withdrawing from the world is not an option. It's not doable and it's not desirable. Our only option is engagement, partnering with others with the same commitment to build a better world in peace, free of hunger, food secured, well nourished and sustainable. We do live in an era of great change and transformation and we last year replaced the Millennium Development Goals with the Sustainable Development Goals. As you know, unanimously adopted by world leaders in New York in September. They are historic and they do represent a paradigm shift. Yes, a paradigm shift. Not only are they broader than the MDGs and developed in a in the most participatory process ever within the UN, but they are universal. They apply to Sweden as well as Sri Lanka, to Norway as well as Nigeria, to Italy as well as India. So gone is the more and more obsolete and false dichotomy between the developed and the developing countries. I think you all have seen Hans Rosling's bubbles when he illustrates that 50 years ago, there was indeed a rich world and a poor world and a gulf in between. Now it's a continuum where five billion out of the seven billion that live on this earth live in middle income countries. Poverty, food insecurity, malnutrition is stark in the low income countries where a billion people live. But today, there are significantly more poor people in middle-income countries. Significantly more in middle-income countries than in poor countries. So naturally, food security is high on the agenda, not only in Africa, but also in many Asian countries and many other countries around the world. And food security is, of course, intimately linked to the other development goals. The Agenda 2030 is an integrated agenda. It's a whole, it's the totality. Now, so with this paradigm shift, in the sense of the SDGs, we are all developing. And just think of the goals in the SDGs of sustainable consumption, fighting climate change, of reducing growing inequality, and the relevance of the goals, at least some of the goals, for Sweden is obvious. A week ago, uh, Monday last week, Prime Minister Stefan Löfven launched the SDG agenda in Sweden. And maybe some of you were there. Yeah, I see some of you that I saw at that event. He was joined, no surprise, by the Minister for Development Cooperation, Isabella Levine, but also by Ardalan Sheikh Arabi, the Minister for Public Administration and in charge of overseeing the implementation of the SDGs in Sweden. And also by the Minister for Strategic Development, Christina Passion. And as a member of her expert group on global cooperation, we're now looking at the multilateral development system where FAO, World Food Program, my old institution, IFAD, other UN agencies, and not least the development banks are addressed and looked at in terms of how can they be made fit for purpose to be backstopping and supporting the implementation of Agenda 2030. Now, when I look at the agri for c initiative, I guess that's what we call it, agri for c Let's try that. 
and it's a fantastic document, well-crafted, well-written, comprehensive. And when I read this, I am struck by how many of the challenges that are the same as 30, 40 years ago. It almost replicates what we wrote in the 70s and the 80s. How to reach out to the smallholder farmer, more often than not a woman in Africa, with advice, with inputs, providing roads and communication, storage possibilities, better practices, more higher yielding varieties, linkages to the market, and with financing. And how to translate high-level CDIR research through national research systems to the farmer's field. The issues, there are some new ones, the daunting effects and challenges of climate change and others, but very much the agenda is very much one we have seen for the last 30, 40 years. What has changed profoundly is the growth in capacity, in institutions, in universities, in a young generation of trained scientists and experts. Some of us had the pleasure of meeting some of those in the reform uh, context uh, last fall. This new situation in terms of competence and in terms of capacity and in terms of institutions, that is very hopeful and that's the bridgehead for engaging in cooperation with the outside world. And that bridgehead is much more developed, much stronger, much wider today than even 10 years ago when I worked on these issues for my IFAD platform. So this gives me very much hope that this program will be able to be successful. Last year also saw the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Now climate change is integral to the SDGs, it's part of the agenda, but it's also a separate track. And as I said, addressing and meeting and managing and handling the challenges of climate change is probably the, the most daunting, most stark, most uh, challenging issue we face today. So it's, and you've, you've heard all the uh, positive statements coming out after Paris. We actually had a tremendous year last year in terms of global leaders coming together, not only around the SDGs unanimously, but also with the exception of Nicaragua, unanimous agreement, unanimous adoption of the Paris Agreement. So the goals, the framework are, is there. It's now all about implementation. It's all about implementation. And of course, key to implementation is knowledge and experience organized in a way that builds institutions, creates viable networks, shares science-based knowledge, and uses the full potential of our digital era. So there is now a decentralized process of action all around the world, and you have seen not only governments, but also the private sector getting involved, civil society, and academic institutions. And the initiative we'll launch today is an, an important, albeit of course in the broader thing, scheme of things, a small, but very important part of this huge global endeavor to, as the Secretary General said, be the first generation to be able to eradicate poverty and be the last to stop global warming. And of course, eradicating poverty is not possible. It's not possible without ending hunger achieving and achieving sustainable food security. So that is why this initiative we'll launch today is so important. Thank you very much.